there everyone welcome to open studio i don't even know what day it is now i've totally lost track but i do know that tomorrow we're doing a project so uh thank you so much for all of you for joining today is just about getting ready for tomorrow hi denise um so fire at me any questions you have that sort of thing um i will go over the materials again for anybody who is um, needing that. Oh, I just see one of the kits sold. So I know I've sold three out of the five kits available. So if you are in the auto area and you are needing a kit, make sure you grab one of those last two kits. It's on my um, Facebook. Um, the kits are on my Facebook business page, which is Christina Lovisa. And they're also on my website, christinalovisa.com. Because I'm not really familiar with how to put things on my website, that was as good as it got. So you have to go into my website and search mixed media kit, okay? Or just mixed media and it'll come up. But it is available through the Facebook page. So I do know that there's only two kits left. So anybody who is in the Ottawa area, I'm delivering right after this um, broadcast today. So make sure you, uh, you get your kit if you're in the area and you need supplies. They're a fantastic value. Well, I, I lost track at $140 worth of product and I'm selling them for $50 just to make sure that um, the list is too long, but it's on my website, uh, Linda. It's, um, it's everything that you'll possibly need to make eight mixed media paintings, um, including everything we're gonna need for tomorrow. So there's eight different panels of varying sizes and papers and glue and paints and everything. So like I said, I lost track at $140 worth of materials or 45. So I just said, forget it. I'll just put it in there and off it goes. So anybody who's in the area, um, Linda, if you are needing a kit, um, I believe Amanda's stopping by her studio today. So just letting you know, because you could grab one and still be able to, um, uh, Amanda lives on uh, on your side of the border, so she'd be able to get it to you. I wish you lived here too, Denise. Anyway, so fire at me your questions, guys. What do we want to know? What are we looking for substitutions? Um, I've had a few questions about glue sticks. So I'm going to talk a little bit about things like that. So right now, because glue is my major issue right now, um, I don't know why my tripod seems so high. Give me one second. I'm gonna see if I can lower this just a wee bit. There, now we can look. Okay, so now you can see me and not just stare at the ceiling, which I'm sorry, there's that big blinding light above my head. Um, maybe I'll try and move it a bit out of the way. Hi, Dulce. Okay, fire at me your questions, guys. So Dulce, Dulce had a, a question this morning about there we go she had a question for me this morning about mod podge um so now that i see she's watching i'll answer that for everybody so it doesn't matter if you're using matte mod podge or um or gloss or matte medium or gloss medium and the answer is for mixed media it absolutely doesn't make a difference you can buy matte gloss whatever dual say notice the price difference but i've never actually seen a price difference but whatever that's all about that's what that's all about um, but it doesn't, for mixed media, it doesn't matter. When it does matter is when you want to put wax on top of it, okay? So that's what we have to be careful of, is if you're going to take your painting and then afterwards add wax medium to it, so in, order, in other words, if you're doing my Two Worlds Collide program, the Two Worlds Collide program does, um, does require that you put uh, like a matte, version of the glue on it and remove as much as possible because the wax won't stick to the gloss okay so it's not necessarily what's in it it's the properties the fact that it's shiny means that it's um reflecting light instead of absorbing light and think of light and wax synonymously so if it can absorb light it can absorb um, meaning it's matte, it can absorb wax. So if it's going to reflect light, meaning it's shiny, then it's going to reflect or repel wax. So I always try to think of it like that to simplify it so that you can understand that when you're looking at your painting, if it's glossy, and then if you want to apply wax to it, you have to make sure that there's no shine to it, okay? So you have to 
do that. So a uh, major question, I still don't have chalk paint. Can I do fully colored and clear and caustic or what else can I do? Okay, so that's a great question. Um, okay, so these only scroll and give me two questions. So if I don't answer your question by the time I get to it, then just ask me again. But um, okay, so let's answer the paint question. Um, so the paint question first is, if you don't have any chalk paint, but you want to be able to transition it later, what should you do? Okay, so you have um, a number of options. If you work really small, hi Heather, if you work really small, then you can use the clear gesso if you have it. Um, you can, later on, you can um, apply a, a thin layer of, of something that's gonna degloss the the surface so like the clear gesso is 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 great for a small surface um the other thing i would recommend is try to use your paints if you have any chalk paint or anything that is absorbent like a clay based paint or a chalk based paint you can add um, a little wash if you will of color over top of it so that's in my book and i know that's a hard concept to get but we'll do that tomorrow actually we'll be putting like a um a chalk paint down and then we'll just be doing a wash of other paints over top okay so um when it's thinned out like that the properties of the chalk paint still come through but if you have no chalk paint whatsoever and you're bound and determined that later on you're going to put wax on this what I would try to recommend is that um, any spots when you look at it later, if they're glossy, they have to be deglazed really before you can put any wax on. If they are glossy, then I would recommend that the spots that are matte um, and not shiny, I would recommend just putting wax on those areas. Like I don't wax my entire boards, I just do, hi Lucy, I, um, I just do some areas, okay? So that's one thing that I would do. Um, great, Linda, that works out perfectly. And uh, yeah, so we're, I'll be seeing Amanda. Well, I'm not sure if I'll be seeing her, but I can leave it for her in her studio and uh, get her to contact you. And then you can do a porch pickup um, at her place. Um, I'm not sure where you guys are in terms of uh, one another, but I don't think it's, it's probably that far apart. So um, that's great, wonderful. So that means there's one kit left. So I messaged a few of you that I know are interested in kits. So make sure you um, you get on that right away if you want a kit, okay? Um, so other questions, sorry, I missed Denise's question because they've scrolled away. Um, but I believe, how do we prepare our boards for tomorrow? Okay, so. I think that was the question. How do we prepare our boards for tomorrow? So you absolutely don't have to do anything because I have a lot of people who are brand new, right? So um, we have people who are joining us who are going to come in with like, like raw wood or raw panel or scrap of wood. Or I know Dulce was telling me that um, she's, or she commented that she's going to use a piece of leftover decking. So decking has it can be, you know, it can be wood, it can be composite, it can be whatever. But the, the thing about decking is that it's been treated with all kinds of chemicals, right, to um, be able to be weatherproof. So when you're working with something like that, if she's got a, like a, some of those chemicals that are in there might just keep bleeding through and bleeding through and bleeding through. So if she had something like that, what I would recommend, I know Dulce is watching, I would recommend that you prime your board um, once or twice to try to cut the um, that bleed through of anything that might come through. Likewise, if you have old, uh, if you're using anything old, even an old painting and you want to start over, then you might want to um, gesso just to get the mediums right. Um, but if you're experienced and you know that you'll be able to still not clear on the paint, when you paint the background, et cetera, with your chalk paint, what can I use? Okay, just one sec. Um, okay, so I'll get back to that question in a second. So as, in terms of preparing your board, um, you don't have to do anything. But if you want to do something, you can do a prime if you've got like a weird type of wood that you're working with. Or you can use, like I said yesterday, you can collage and glue down a background just to have it dry. 
So the reason you would want to have it dry is um, just so that they don't lift from one another when you are doing your uh, scratching and stuff like that. So, but it's not necessary because tomorrow I'm working from raw wood just to be able to show the whole, whole process. So for prepping your board, totally not necessary. Priming it if you have a weird board that might be um, leaking through chemicals or stain or something that you're not interested in having show through in your work. Um, I think that's about it for preparing. Like I said, I'm starting from raw tomorrow and, um, yeah, that's it. So, okay. So still not clear on that. Okay. So let's, let's, um, try and explain that for Heather. Um, I don't have any paints out today. As you see, I'm wearing a white shirt today. Um, okay. So this is my palette. Right, so I'm going to pretend that I've dispensed some paint on here. And you know what, to be clear, I might even just do um, acrylic tomorrow. So I don't even know if I'm going to use chalk paints because this painting isn't necessarily an encaustic based project. So, um, so just to be clear on that, anybody who's watching who's like, oh, I don't have encaustic or whatever that is, don't worry about that. This project is not going to be designed to be transitioned. It's just for the more experienced people. You will understand what I'm talking about when I say now, if you're preparing this for um, an encaustic finish, then you can always transition it afterwards by substituting this for this. So if I were to use chalk paint, so let me grab my painting, one of these so I can explain to you, cause there's a little bit of wax on here, but so very, very little. Actually, I have one more thing I'm gonna go grab. One more thing I'm gonna grab. Sorry, I just thought of another readily available transition medium. So, okay, so let's say I do, you know, this bit of painting in chalk paint, chalk paint, chalk paint, chalk paint. I'm gonna talk about chalk paint right now, but like I said, tomorrow I might be using um, uh, acrylic paint. So, okay, so thanks Jen. So she's, she's helping to answer the question. So what I'm trying to do, what I'm gonna to do tomorrow is I'm gonna use um, chalk paint, right? And then let's say I don't have um, green chalk paint then I can take, I can put down what I have, the white, and I can then float a little bit of green acrylic over it so I'm staining the, um, the chalk paint below green. Okay, so we're gonna do that tomorrow. But let's say I don't have any white chalk paint and you're going to use um, uh, acrylic paints. You put your acrylic paints down and then you'll need to transition it later if you're gonna put um, encaustic over it. So what I would use all the time is uh, Liquitex clear gesso. If you don't have Liquitex clear gesso, here's another little hack that we can buy even at a hardware store right now, um, is furniture wax. So this one that I buy all the time is from Lee Valley and Lee Valley is actually doing um, free shipping. So you could always order this wax, but it's called Clapman's Beeswax Polish. And I tend to use this because you can actually fuse it. So you don't have to fuse it, but you can fuse it. And it looks like beeswax on top. So um, somebody was asking me yesterday, or a couple days ago, if we could do faux beeswax and uh, like a faux encaustic finish. So that's actually how we're gonna finish our piece tomorrow. For those who are not going to um, do encaustic later on, we're gonna do faux encaustic at the end of our project tomorrow, okay? So, and it doesn't have to be Clapman's, but you can buy different furniture waxes. I just like the Clapman's because it is beeswax. It does have a little bit of a solvent in it, meaning that, yes, it's gonna sink just a wee bit, but that solvent has to um, evaporate in order for the wax to dry or solidify. 
So, but the nice thing about the Kleppmann's one is that in a well ventilated area, you can just fuse it with a heat gun and it'll go liquid just like, um, just like molten beeswax. And then when it cools, it'll be nice and foggy. And then when that cools, then it'll have that beeswax finish. So we're gonna use this tomorrow as a faux beeswax finish, but you can also use this to transition between acrylic and encaustic later, okay? So um, now I, I realize now that I didn't answer your question, but I hope you guys got that straightened out about, um, about collage. I didn't understand that there was a collage question in there, but um, does anybody else have any questions that I haven't answered yet about tomorrow? Um, I'll just keep watching, but in the meantime, uh, we'll go over our materials again. You're going to need some type of a surface. So I always call this your um, your substrate. So whether you're painting on wood or canvas or whatever, the only difference between painting on canvas and or a um, wood panel um, is that the canvas, if you're going to do any scratching or gouging, okay, Denise says, I only have chalk paint, no acrylics. Yeah, perfect. And so you can transition yours afterwards, no problem. And then um, we'll wax it here to National Geographic magazine paper. Great question. So it's shiny, right? So at the end, I always deglaze anything shiny. So um, whether that be with the Liquitex Clear Gesso or any kind of a beeswax polish, um, if I want to put wax on top of it. If I don't, then sometimes what I do is I just take a little bit of my matte Mod Podge when I'm done and I'll just kind of brush it over to take the shine out of it. So, how do you collage an image when you have encaustic and you want to add something? Uh, that's more of like a tutorial. Yeah, that's what, that one's a bit complicated, Dulce, just because we're not working with encaustic tomorrow, so I won't be able to answer that question. Um, it, it's a bit more complicated because the surface has to be perfectly flat if you don't want to get any, hi Billy, you don't want to get any air pockets under your image and things like that. So um, maybe we'll save that for when we do encaustic. If you're watching again, you could remind me and I'll go over that because I think one of the next, and I was going to announce this later, but maybe I'll just tell you guys now that next week I'm going to start because I've had a number of questions of how do you fix a painting or how do you change a painting when you've already got something existing and you want to you now change mediums or change the painting or whatever without maybe losing everything entirely or maybe you do want to lose it entirely i'm not really one as you have probably heard uh are you taking talking about that had citrus solve on it first i was straight on citrus solve paper i waxed straight oh yeah so the citrus solve paper what that's done is the citrus solve has, has already taken out that gloss right so the thing about national geographic is that those those papers have been glossed so like spray glossed or whatever that's why you're getting that really nice um, shine to the quality of the paper so um, if you are using the citrus salt one then you don't need to degloss it so we'll we'll talk about that tomorrow when we get into your images because if you do have a shiny spot you will need to degloss it if you want to put wax on and there's many ways you can do that but um, not to worry so and they'll say yes so to get back to your questions i will be next week working on, with people answering questions on how you take a painting that has either bombed or failed or you only got halfway and you grew bored of it or whatever and maybe you don't want to lose that painting altogether you just want to change it you want to fix it you want to keep working it you want to whatever I don't believe in just gessoing over the whole thing and starting fresh. I believe that everything you've already done to that painting is a contributing layer to the outcome. So um, because I've got that question a lot, I think I'll uh, address that both, both at a mixed media level and also at an acoustic level because there are two very different ways of approaching, um, approaching things like that. Um, my, my short answer though, if you really want to do it this weekend or something like that is to um, print it onto rice paper like print your this may be off topic where are you getting your large photocopies done staples won't print them anymore um, I just picked some up that's weird like they're not during this outbreak you mean 
Anyway, so Crystal's asking about large photocopies done, and she's saying that they won't print them anymore. So maybe it's during the outbreak that they're not doing the um, large printing. Let me know about that, because I just picked some up. So maybe it's staples in your area, or... Anyway, let me know. Um, so yeah, so thank you, Lucy. So I know a lot of you probably have a lot of paintings sitting around that you're thinking, because I can pull out, like I can go to my studio right now and I can probably take out a dozen paintings that, or probably more like three dozen paintings that I've either started or I, you know, I was really excited about a topic or something. And then in true Christina Lovisa fashion, instead of making one, I make 12. And then by like number seven, I've kind of lost interest in them. So um, I just have to decide, like, am I going to finish them? Am I going to change them? Am I going to, um, that sort of thing. So, and I can tell you for anybody who was part of that fundraiser that I did last week, I'm not sure if those paintings are here or not. Um, oh, they're over there. But anyway, they won't ever print engineer prints at all, ever. That's what they say. Ah, okay. Crystal, send me an email, like to ChristinaLoviza at gmail.com, and I will reply when I get home on my laptop. I'll send you a PDF on how to order them online. So try that, because that's weird. Um, yeah, that's weird, because I, I, like I said, I still order them. I always order them online. I never um, go to the counter, because I find that probably pretty crusty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure why they're so they're so unfriendly sometimes when you go to the counter. Um, anyway, I do it all online and, and I always get them and I always do uh, pick up so I just go and pick up anyway and now they just happen to bring it right out to my car so it's pretty sweet. Anyway, so yeah, please send me an email and ChristinaLoviza at gmail.com and I will reply with a PDF for step by step on how to um, order them. Um, okay, so yeah, so getting back to next week, we're going to be transitioning and or fixing and or repurposing old paintings um, because I think it's a hot topic seeing as I keep getting that question over and over again. What if I don't like what I've done? What if I want to change something? What if I, you know, and so, and I realize, like I said, that I have three dozen in my studio to start off with. So um, there'll be no shortage of uh, examples and supplies of um of paintings either abandoned or failed or whatever. So for tomorrow, right? We need our substrate. So like I said, you can paint on it. You can even paint on paper if you really have nothing else. Um, take out the heaviest piece of paper you have. I used to, when I was really desperate for um, art supplies, I remember we were, I was, oh, I know my son had knee surgery and I was staying with him. And so I was looking around this Airbnb and I didn't want them to, the people to miss anything. Like, you know, I take down one of their paintings and paint over it. But I was desperate for art supplies, so I actually took down their calendar. They had a calendar on the wall. And the back page, you know, it's that sturdy cardboard. I took, ripped the back cover off, and, um, and there was nothing really on the back cover other than, you know, how to order more ca calendars. So I took the back cover off, and I went to Walmart, and I had bought myself this little... Um, uh, art set and they didn't have any canvases at this little at this little uh, Walmart they didn't have anything so I took this piece of paper and I just put some white paint on it and I started painting on that white uh, paper and then when I got home I actually adhered that to a board which is another great thing to watch hi Lisa which is another great uh, technique to learn because when you paint on paper um, if your paper is really heavy and now you've added all that mixed media stuff, it's really hard to get that to lay flat and adhere to a block of wood or a piece of wood or something later on to be able to mount it to the wall. Um, so that's another topic. So we do have so many things we could talk about, but next week we're going to talk about um, transitioning, repurposing, and or salvaging old artwork. Um, I've even gone so far that maybe if I do an episode from my own house, I can show you in my home studio I actually have a painting that I've, I've done a few where I've bought paintings from flea markets or garage sales or whatever and then I've actually just added to them and painted over and left little bits showing and things like that and to me it's like somebody discarded this thing and I've just made it a little more um, 
interesting to me. So that's that's another thing we can talk about. Um, yeah, so for tomorrow, you'll need a substrate of some kind. And like I said, even not uh, careful about copyright on National Geographic can't be recognized as a photographer's piece without approval to use it. Uh, yeah, so especially if you guys are selling your work. If you're just, um, when adding a feather to a piece, is it best to attach a tail? I'll try and get back to that question in one sec. Hi, Margo. I've got, uh, if you're just tuning in, we've got some news for you. So, um, yeah, so the substrate, I've lost all the questions. So, I'm sorry, um, when adding a feather to a piece, is it best to attach it with a wire? Uh, it just depends if you want to change the look of the feather like if you don't mind encapsulating it in wax then You don't need to if you want it to look exactly like a feather Then it is best to drill two little holes and wire it through um, Expecting gel medium or Mod Podge to hold anything of significance down is really impossible um, so what I always do is if I'm in mixed media and I want something to stay put right now just while I'm painting, I'll just actually use a hot glue gun and I tack things in place and then I'll just paint around that hot glue. Um, another thing that I do is I'll tack it down. If it's something heavy, like let's say you want to put in a metal object, a lot of people like to used to put in old keys and things like that or a little glass bottle or something. Um, I would attach that with a stronger glue, like a more industrial glue. Um, an E6000 is clear. Hi, Pam. Um, an E6000 is clear. Um, I like PL Premium, but it's not clear. Um, but it holds things a lot better temporarily than the E6000. So that's another good one to use. But like if you're using a clear glass bottle, you obviously wouldn't want this green glue to show through so that's where you would use a clear one um, yeah so if you want to hold something right now like right tomorrow you want to put in some um, some textural pieces uh, you can use I always use a hot glue gun because it's just it's easier it's fast it's right there but that's for something lighter right so a feather would be great because you can put it along the spine and just press it into the glue and um, that would be sort of like one of the things that you would do at the end if you didn't want to change, hi Nikki, you didn't want to change the appearance of the um, feather at all, right? So, sorry, I think I missed a question in there. So if you have a question, we'll back up and we'll go to it. It's just that once the scroll's gone, I can't see it anymore. And um, yeah, I wish I had better memory than I apparently do. <laughs> Apologies. Um, so, I think that is about it for that. We were talking about substrates. Uh, oh, that was a copyright. So copyright, don't get too bent out of shape about that unless you're selling your pieces. That's all I can say is that if it's for your own purpose or you're selling it to a friend or, you know, like if you're putting your pieces online for sale, that sort of thing, then I would be a little more concerned about copyrights and things like that. But if they're for your own purpose, your own learning, your own whatever there are rules I have worked for publishing companies for a long time and in Canada anyway it's about percentage so you have to change it 75% an image 75% in order to be considered your own um, then you could take that like to the nth degree right like how much is 75 um, 75% and which judge is actually going to be there to <laughs> to quantify that so I don't know how it all works but I'm just saying if you're going to use um, something that has a copyright on it I always just ask myself two questions like one is this going to get me in trouble because I'm stealing someone else's work so I put my work out there publicly all the time and so the answer would be yes right so I'm not going to use anything like that I have my work printed so um, I'm not even gonna fuss around with that 75, 25, whatever. Let's say I were to take, um, let's use this as an image right here, right? So you can Google what the rights are to use Mona Lisa. So um, I actually do have a painting um, that's been bought by a local um, collector 
but as well that piece has been printed by my publisher and they deemed that it had been changed 75 percent so i'll tell you what i did so i have this one little picture of mona lisa and the rest is all my backgrounds and all of that stuff the whole background of her has been painted out but the background is not necessarily considered the part that would be licensed or um, copyrighted right it's really just her image I mean if you just use her hands or her throat or whatever no one's ever gonna go oh that's the Mona Lisa I know it um, it's really just her face right so when I did this I made sure that I had changed enough of the painting but I had cropped out most of her so it was just her face cropped out a lot of it so that changed a little bit right it's still very recognizable as the Mona Lisa but then I did a couple layers of um, transfers on top so I actually put a lace thing over her face and then um, some more uh, a different color lace coming down the other side and then there was a pattern of fish fish scales going up her neck and then over top of one eye actually she had a big monocle so it changed it so much like it became so much hi Rochelle it became so steampunk that you couldn't actually even recognize it anymore you could tell that I had altered it but even the publishing company said that it wasn't enough to get you in trouble so get me in trouble so that was that um, or get them in trouble for that matter so um, the part that Sophie asked I think about wax is yes wax so no I'm gonna answer that question differently we're going to make sure that when you put wax on something you're always checking the sheen of it right if it's shiny so I'll repeat that again so my rule of thumb when I'm assessing a painting whether or not I can put wax on it a mixed media paint whether it can put wax on it is if it absorbs light that means that it's going to absorb wax. So how do we know it absorbs light? It's because it's matte, it's not reflecting, right? So if it's not reflecting the light, it's absorbing the light, so it's going to absorb wax. So, um, I believe she said she would talk about what to put on it before waxing tomorrow. Okay, yeah. So, and then um, if it reflects light, it's shiny, right? A mirror, anything glossy, it reflects light. So it's going to repel or reflect the wax. So I just use that as a little rule of thumb when I'm assessing my picture. And then I'll talk tomorrow about deglazing. Um, but one way that I deglaze often is with the Liquitex Clear Gesso or with any type of a furniture wax, as long as it's a wax, not just a polish. Um, yeah, and I happen to like the Clapman's Bees Wax uh, because I can fuse it and I don't have to wait for it to um, dry. And this one is available online at Lee Valley. And I just got a flyer from Lee Valley yesterday saying that they are doing, hi Karen, they're saying that they're doing um, free shipping. And um, yeah, it's a great, great, great mixed media tool. So that's how we're going to finish our painting tomorrow. Um, so yeah, so there's nothing you have to do to prepare for tomorrow so don't worry about preparing your image don't worry about anything um, I did take that image of the chair in case we use it which is a magazine image let me go grab it talk amongst yourselves okay I'm back so this is that magazine image that I took out um, of just a magazine which is just really not very good quality it's just you know magazine quality and um, I had told you that if I put wax on this right if I put wax on this my risk would be that the image sure Rhonda I can do that for sure um, so I'll hold the label up once again or is it backwards to you guys I can't even tell probably right it's clap clap hams right um, and beeswax polish and I will put a picture of it thanks Jen that's awesome and then um, so there's the magazine image and then on the back I went ahead and I painted it white so I just used whatever I had lying around I don't even know what it was uh, it could be a white paint could be a gesso probably gesso um, it doesn't matter I just blocked out 
what was going to potentially bleed through. So it's not that that's like foolproof, but it is going to help protect this image should I decide to put wax on it because when we fuse, especially with the iron, when we fuse the wax, it sometimes makes the paper go translucent and then whatever is printed on the other side of it will bleed through. So if that doesn't bother you, like this is not something that I, I often do, but if you want to prepare any magazine images or something like even text books, pages out of the book, you can always just prime the back of them so that you'll reduce the um, likelihood that you'll get bleed through. So um, that is all I did to prepare. I'm not preparing my board because like I said, tomorrow I'm gonna do the board um, live so that because like I said we have a lot of beginners that are following along and I want to make sure that everybody gets the um, gets the memo on that and um, what else so make sure you have why don't we go over the list of things again okay the tools and I'm gonna turn this around around and we'll go over the tools and supplies again so you'll want to make sure that you have an apron or some clothes that you don't mind getting dirty so that means um, I think the question came the other day from maybe it was Jan if she had to change out of her pajamas the answer is absolutely not just cover them up if you um, if you do oh good question niece um, so make sure you cover them up if you don't want to get paint on them um, Oh, yeah, thanks. That's a very good point. Ah, uh, okay. So that was a great point. I'm going to add that to my list so I don't forget because tomorrow, um, it's not something you have to run out and get, and that's why I hadn't really addressed it. Um, I want this class to be as um, user-friendly in terms of supplies that you might have at home instead of having to uh, run out to the store and buy anything. I really, really, really want to be able to answer questions tomorrow on the fly. I won't be able to answer a lot of questions because we have a lot to do in one hour, but I will, if somebody has a substitution, like, ah, I don't have that. So then it could be that I just forgot to tell you, but we could talk about a substitution. Okay, so I'll get to it. So you want an apron or something to cover up your nice clean pajamas. Um, a palette of some kind, right? And that can just be like an old styrofoam meat tray. It can just be a piece of wax paper on a cutting board. It can be whatever you want. It's just your palette um, is your palette. Paper towel. So this is what I was going to use tomorrow um, with water, right? Tomorrow I was going to use paper towel and water. But one thing I often do use, and if you have them, great, but don't run out if you don't think you can, you, you're gonna need them right now, um, is baby wipes. So in the kits, which I have one left by the way guys, so if anybody is watching this, um, I don't know who's bought their kit, but I have seen the number go by, I think there's only one left. So if you do need a kit, I don't have any more materials to put them together. So today, after this broadcast, I am delivering them. So make sure that you buy your kit if you need a kit. And it's on my business page, Christina Lovisa, on Facebook. Uh, it's also on my website, but you have to Google Mixed Media. Um, or not Google, so you have to search in within my website because I didn't know how to put it or where to put it. So, um, But anyway, so there will be a few baby wipes in your kit as well. And for those of you who don't have baby wipes, don't rush out to the store to buy baby wipes. You will just ha need paper towel and water. I like water in a spray bottle just because I can create drips that way, but it's not necessary. You could just have a dish or a cup of water. I do always have a dish or a cup of water handy anyway because I have to be able to clean my brushes. So moving away from that, then we're going to need our glue. So right now my glue container is empty, but assume that this is filled with um, Mod Podge. Or so I, I looked up the recipe this morning, which I really had to laugh about because I looked up the recipe for homemade Mod Podge and it's just equal parts white glue to water. So really not that scientific and if you have glue you have Mod Podge um, just by adding water to it apparently. I don't know if that's entirely true because I tell you I've made lots of uh, Pinterest recipes and they're not always in terms of art supplies they're not always the best but 
because I'm desperate too, I have no more Mod Podge, I have no more wallpaper paste right now, I have nothing, I'm reduced to the same white glue mixture that many of you may be um, stuck with tomorrow. So like I said, this is going to be mixed media on the fly because sometimes that's what we have to do, right? Sometimes we have to be able to improvise with what we have because we don't always have access to the best art materials or um, whatever. So then you will need background images. So I'm going to get rid of him because I want to show you that background images are not foreground images, right? So background images include... Um, There we go, scrapbook paper or um, any kind of, like this is books, pages out of an old book, more scrapbook paper or newsprint or anything like that that just has a, a tight pattern. When I say a tight plat pattern, I actually like the words versus images and things like that. I especially don't want you to use any type of image that might be considered foreground okay so um i'm not saying that it's wrong if that's your technique then absolutely go for it i just if you want to learn the steps that i go through when i make a mixed media painting this is one approach so i probably have about five different approaches that are my go-to approaches and this is one of them so i won't be walking you through five approaches we'll be walking through one okay so that one is you have your background paper and then you have your foreground image. So um, oftentimes people will ask me um, or people in a class will say that they want to make a gift using a photograph. Actually, I'll go and I'll grab something else and you guys can come for a little walk with me so I don't have to move them. But over here in the studio, I have some samples from a, a class I did before. And so these are actually, they're so cute. So these are actually um, little pictures, photographs that I made into these little pieces of art. So I have, um, that's my mom on her first day of school, and then that's her, her dad. And so anyway, so I had these little, little paintings that I made just so that the only important thing to me was the picture of the person. I didn't actually care too much about the background. So a lot of times people will want to make a gift for someone. And when they're making that gift, they don't necessarily want to include, um, you know, or just frame a picture like this one here. This is the one we're going to use tomorrow, right? They want to actually um, turn it into a piece of art. So that's what we're going to do. So foreground image, right? Foreground image, foreground image. And then the chair was another foreground image. Oh, it's all the way over here. So foreground image. So foreground image is very different from um, background image, right? Background image is not really an image. It's just pattern, color, that sort of thing. Try to avoid too much texture early on. Um, that's why I like scrapbook papers. They're nice and flat. So Denise asked me if I'll talk about sides of the board. And um, Denise always reminds me about this in class because I don't, I don't actually, hi Tracy, I don't actually um, care about the sides of my board. It's not that I don't care about them. It's just that they're not um, something that I think about until the end. So I can look down at any one of my paintings. I've got a few on the floor here. So if you look at the sides, like this one's got paint all over it. This one has got some wax and then I've painted it white. So when I actually finish my painting, meaning that the painting is done, it's been photographed, it's signed, and then it's going to get wired. Once it gets wired, then I do my, my final sweep of the paintings, so to speak. So in that case, I'll go over it. I'll make sure there's no bits of paper falling off or anything's loose or anything hasn't been fused or whatever. And then when all that is said and done and the painting is actually totally done, then I go around with my electric sander and I generally give all my edges a quick sanding. And then if there's stains and things like that that I don't like, then I might choose to paint the edge. Um, 
but that's just my process. So there's a lot of people who wax their sides, who paint their sides, but I know Denise, Denise tapes her sides. So Denise will be spending some time today preparing her board with um, painter's tape around the edge to um, keep the edge nice and clean. So here's a perfect example of what I would do or what I do all the time is later on, I just took a little bit of my paint and my collage and I just wrapped it right around the edge so that this piece had one continuous feel to it. Okay, so if I tape my edges and then I peel the tape off, then I can't finish my edges as I go. So, which in, in usually in the case of a small painting, I tend to just paint right over the edge. Um, in a bigger piece like that one I just showed you with the stain, I would probably just paint it afterwards. And if I've managed to keep it relatively clean, I might even just leave it raw wood. Um, okay, back to materials. So, um, baby wipes. So, if you have baby wipes, great. If you don't, don't worry about it. Glue of some kind. Desperately need glue. Your paints. I don't have any paints here because they are all over here, but let me just show you. Once I get past all my my messy collage so this is my bin of one of my bins of supplies so that's brushes and scratchy tools and all kinds of stuff but here um are is one bin of chalk paints and then this is one bin of acrylics so i'll be able to just pull out a few tomorrow um, because this is meant to be um, what you have in your studio I'm not going to make myself accessible to every color in the world because I want you to be able to um, mix your own colors and things like that so I too am going to work with a very limited palette of probably like four or five colors tomorrow um, and then show you how I, I do um, what I call a dirty brush technique to just make my own colors as I go and keep it um, keep it flowing throughout the painting so that I don't end up with like uh, colors that don't match and things like that. Um, another question I had yesterday, which I'll just answer now again, is somebody said to me, Does, do we need black and white or colored photographs? It's absolutely up to you. So if you looked at the painting that I did with the moose, um, it started out as a black and white, but in the end I ended up painting them blue. So I don't know that to me it just it worked out but had the moose been a colored photograph a colored print it would have looked very different right it might have looked something more like this like he would have had colors that complemented the colors of the moose rather than me being free and clear like in this one here to be able to paint in whatever color I want so um, it doesn't matter if you want to use color black and white you just want to make sure that you're um, going to be able to draw a nice complement between your background and your foreground, okay? Um, meaning, I wouldn't glue down red paper if you say, oh, I hate red, I would never hang red in my house. So then don't put down red first, right? So put down a color that maybe you might like as an accent or that's why I tend to use a lot of newsprint and things like that because it's very neutral. So whatever comes through comes through and I'm not locked in or tied into a particular color. But sometimes I'm just drawn to lots of colors, so that's what I would do. Um, there's no right or wrong tomorrow. It's gonna be fun. Um, yeah, foreground images. Try to choose something that you can cut around, right? If someone desperately wants a kit and they're not available, I can forfeit mine. Okay, <laughs> so we'll see. So um, Tracy, there is a kit. Um, available but there's only one left so and I'm, I'm not sure who else are getting the kits but anyway so uh, one kit left and thank you but that's very nice of you Linda so um, yeah that's that try not to choose an image like I said that you have to transfer because we're not gonna have time to do a transfer tomorrow and what that means is something that you can't cut out so something like this photograph that I took like how would you ever cut that out right you would actually have to do like the technique I did with the moose um, where I tore around the outside of it and then had to integrate that and for the purpose of our our show tomorrow we don't have time um, we don't have time unfortunately within the hour to complete that so uh, if you do get hung up on the cutting out portion it will 
slow you down tomorrow. So make sure you have an image that like this chair or like my friend Albert here that I'd be able to cut around, okay, quite easily. And that's why I use a knife. We had talked about tools yesterday, so I would use a little X-Acto knife. If you don't have an X-Acto knife, then see if you can get a little razor blade out of a, out of a box cutting knife at home or something like that. Um, any kind of a scratching tool will work. Um, you know what I actually use a lot of that you might have lying around that we don't often use? are fondue forks. So I often use a fondue fork, great little scratching tool, especially because you can use one of the little tines or you can use two. So you can even get parallel scratch marks, which is kind of fun. Um, there you go, perfect. And um, what else can I tell you? So your images, oh yeah, and then bits and pieces. So if you have extra papers lying around, if you have textural things, um, if you have, I don't know, buttons or whatever you want, we'll have time to probably just adhere one or two little textural things at the end. Um, a lot of times people ask me about fabric and materials and things like that, so maybe what I'll do is I will go through my drawers and pull out a little bit of fabric so that I remember to glue something like that in. I'm also looking in here, there's a little bit of trim. so. One of those things might work tomorrow, just adding a little bit. Um, yeah, so stay tuned. Tomorrow is going to be a jam-packed fun day. We are going to um, follow along quickly, right, in order to get done. And then what I'm going to do is over the weekend, instead of um, doing a broadcast, what I might do is answer your questions. So if you had, um, whether I do it live or whether I do it uh, just on the Facebook, you'll just want to keep checking back because what I'm going to do is I'm sure you're going to have individual questions. And so rather than addressing them tomorrow so that we're, we're um, let me put this back so that we can see each other. Um, rather than having individual questions um, during the broadcast, we'll just wait and I'll do that over the weekend, okay? So I'll answer your questions and that kind of thing. A um, couple big announcements tomorrow and uh, don't forget, anybody who posts what they've made tomorrow or on the weekend, because you do, uh, I am extending it for those who um, aren't able to watch live and to be able to work live, so I am gonna extend it to the weekend. And then on Monday, we will reveal some, um, some prizes. So I'm really excited about that. What do you have to do to win a prize? I've had that a few times now, a couple questions. And the answer is, I don't even know yet. I just know that um, I'm an equalitarian, if that's a word. I like everybody to come out even at the end. So I'm not gonna be judging whose painting is the best or you know who, none of that stuff. It's not about that. It's um, more about the spirit of participation. So thank you, everybody. And um, great, great, great last few days. Your participation's been incredible, which makes me believe that people really do want to dive in and do something together. So I'm really excited about tomorrow. So sleep well. Don't stress out about anything. This is just fun, right? But you do have to participate or you do have to post something over the weekend to make sure that you are part of the um, uh, friendly competition. Okay? Bye, everybody.